So Daniel chapter 5, this morning as we continue our study, we're going we're gonna, to uh, complete the chapter in its entirety this, this morning in this study, as we did at first service. And also, just on a quick note, as you're finding your place there, if you're going to title this message, you can title it the beginning of the end, because ultimately this is what's transpiring. We're going to be looking at what would be known as the end of the time of Babylon. The captivity would end in a sense, with the ending of Babylon, but the captivity has ended for a period of time already. And we'll kind of give some highlights on that. But up until this chapter in the book of Daniel, we've been focused a lot on the life of Daniel the prophet and a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And a couple of things that we've seen in this relationship with with the prophet and the king is that God used the prophet Daniel, this young man who was taken captive by this king, to do some great work among the people of Babylon. But not only that, there was opportunity for God's name to be exalted and lifted high. There was also opportunity for this very powerful king to be humbled by the Lord God. And so when you look at this, you'll see that a couple of things have already been established. Some pretty profound and powerful things have happened up to this point when we get to chapter 5. Now for more of a chronological study of the book of Daniel, you'll note that within that book, you'll see that in between chapters 4 and 5 is where chapters 7 and 8 actually take place. So chapters 7 and 8 really occur in between chapters 4 and 5. And so with that here, we kind of get a chronological view of it, but for the sake of our time this morning, we'll be looking at chapter 5 and not studying it from a chronological significance. And so in chapter 5, we see now the name of another king in verse 1. His name is Belshazzar. And so the point I want to make, if you're taking notes for our own personal study and read, Take note that in between chapters 4 and 5, there's a period of 20 years that have transpired. 20 years have taken place. What has happened? Well, in chapter 4, we read the very powerful testimony of Nebuchadnezzar, the king. And we see that the Lord had humbled Nebuchadnezzar, first giving him a warning by a dream. And remember that this was one of these dreams of Nebuchadnezzar that the Lord had given him and had shown him and then the interpretation came by the prophet. This has been a a constant relationship between Daniel and the king. But in this one here, the Lord was warning the king. And rather than heeding the warning of the Lord, the king once again lifted up the pride in his heart and God humbled Nebuchadnezzar. Now this is interesting because we see that at the end of chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar praises the God of Israel. And remember that when we study back the history of God's people, they are in Babylon because they rejected and resisted God's word. So with that, there was a time in which the Lord said that their captivity would be for a period of 70 years. Well, up until this point, in between chapters 4 and 5, the captivity has already ended. The 70 years are completed. And now what you have here is in chapter 5, a picture of Babylon now ending and the Medo-Persian Empire coming into power just like Daniel said in Daniel chapter 2. Remember the image that Nebuchadnezzar needed an interpretation of. The image was this, this image with a head of gold. Remember that? And so he said to Nebuchadnezzar, this is you. And he began to work his way down all the way down to the very clay and iron feet mixed together but each was an empire. Each was an empire that would rule and an empire that would reign. And so the next empire to come into power as Daniel was explaining this to him was the arms, the chest and its arms of silver. This is the Medo-Persian empire. In chapter 2, in verse 32, the Bible says, The image head was of fine gold, its chest and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. This image that Nebuchadnezzar in his dream seen and that Daniel interpreted for him was remember that the gold was Babylon, the head of gold was Babylon, 
and the chest and arms of silver was the Medo-Persian Empire, and the belly and the thighs of bronze was the Grecian Empire, and then the legs of iron was the Roman Empire, and then the feet, partly clay and partly iron, looks further ahead to what would be recognized in Bible prophecy as the empire of the Antichrist. And so we have here a fulfillment of this very prophecy in Daniel chapter 5 because the head of gold will now be destroyed by the chest and the arms of silver. So what have we learned? Well, we know that God is faithful, right, in keeping his promises. But we also know, too, that God had used Daniel in a very interesting way. The first encounter that the king had with Daniel was in chapter 1 when the king himself tested Daniel and his friends. Remember that it was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah that were part of a group that were taken captive by Babylon from the southern kingdom, Jerusalem, Judah. And remember, up until this point, God was judging his people because of their rejection of his word. And so ultimately, through the prophet Jeremiah, we see that the Lord spoke specifically concerning the people of the southern kingdom that they would be taken captive for a period of 70 years. What's interesting here is that Daniel and his friends were put in a place in which God would use them to be a witness. To be a witness of God's glory, of God's power, of God's goodness, of God's faithfulness. God uses you and me as witnesses to testify of who he is. Oftentimes we think our lives don't have significance. If you were to look at the lives of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these were their Babylonian names, you would think that perhaps in their minds they would think, how could God use me here? God used them mightily. At the first encounter they had with the king in chapter 1, let's draw our attention very quickly to verse 19. The Bible says, And the king interviewed them, and among them all... Among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those were their Hebrews' names. Later changed to Belshazzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It says, they were interviewed by the king, therefore they served before the king. Look at verse 20. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. So the Lord had already set Daniel and his friends apart and they were now viewed by the king as being these young Hebrew men because remember, they were young when they were taken captive. They were teenagers. And they were already set apart from all the other, uh, let's just say, astrologers and, and people of authority in the kingdom of Babylon at a very young age. The Bible even goes on to say that at a time in which Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he was troubled by it, we read about it in chapter 2. We've studied this in great detail. Well, we know that ultimately the best that Babylon could produce, all of their prophets, if you will, their soothsayers and their magicians could never tell the dream of the king, but the Lord used Daniel to tell it. And then the Bible says here was the end result. So the first, the first encounter, he recognized something great in Daniel and his friends, right? His second encounter, Daniel interprets the dream when none of the best that Babylon could produce could interpret the dream. And the Bible says that as Daniel explains the dream to the king, this was the king's response now. The king said this after the dream was interpreted. In verse 46, it says of chapter 2, Then Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel, gave him many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men. Because Daniel was able to interpret the dream, it brought Nebuchadnezzar to a place where he worshipped the God of Israel. Pretty interesting point. Then in chapter 3, we know the story. We studied it in great detail. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These were Daniel's friends. And remember, the king, after a period of time, maybe you know, 14, 15 years, made this golden image and wanted the people to bow down and worship it. Perhaps influenced by the dream that he had. In other words, I don't just want to be the head of gold. I want to be all gold so nobody defeats me and conquers me. But in this whole image... 
Nebuchadnezzar made himself to be God. He wanted to be worshipped. And trust me, this was the common practice of the kings of these days. This is what they would do. They would deify themselves. So Nebuchadnezzar in one way was humbled because God proved himself through Daniel. And he says, you know what? Praise to your God. But it seems like he forgot not too long after. And he began to bring the people to a place to worship him once again, the Lord humbles him. These three Hebrew friends of Daniel, Daniel nowhere in sight, didn't bow down to the golden image. They said, we cannot worship an idol. We cannot. And as a matter of fact, they said, listen, here's what's going to happen. They weren't in no way arguing with King Nebuchadnezzar. He tried to give them a chance. He's like, you know, when it sounds, you can go. You hear the music, go and bow. He says, listen, we can't do this. And remember what Nebuchadnezzar said, what God will deliver you from my hands? What God will deliver? Who can do it? No God can deliver you from my hands. And they said, what did they say? Even if he doesn't deliver us, we will still not bow. Wow, they were okay with whatever decision God made. Sometimes God's decisions don't work out the way we want them to work out. What they resolved in their heart is no matter the decision, we're going to worship our Lord. I love that. I love having a faith that doesn't matter what you're getting from God. All that matters is that you're his son and you're his daughter. You've been called, you've been redeemed, and your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen? Amen. And I'll tell you, it doesn't matter. God's already done enough. My statement that I always make is I say this. If Jesus only came to die for my sins, he's done enough. He's done enough. And this is what they were saying. They were declaring this. So you, what did Nebuchadnezzar say? You know what? Turn that thing up, you know, higher. Not like they had a thermostat or anything. He just said, make it hotter than it normally is. His men died taking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in there. So they throw them down bound. He looks in. He's kind of peering in. All of a sudden, he sees four men walking. He hears praising taking place. What's going on in there? He looks and there they are. And the next thing you know, he says, there's one like the son of man in there. He knew there was something divine about the fourth image. He looked to his guy. He said, didn't we throw three in there? They're like, oh yes, king. He said, oh, there's four. They're like, oh, you need to learn how to count. No. <laughs> they would never say that to him because he'd kill them, right? He's not even worried about his men that died. He says, there's four in there. All of a sudden, guys, listen. He looks and he realizes. He goes and he calls out to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He calls out to them. And the next thing you know, in calling out to them, what happens? They come out and the Bible says they're not bound no more. Their clothes is not burned. Their hair is not nothing. They don't even smell like smoke. And what does he do? Well, the Bible says this. Look at very quickly with me. Verse 26 of chapter 3. The Bible says, Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came in the midst of the fire. Check this out, guys. And the set traps, administrators, governors, kings, counselors gathered together and they saw these men whose bodies the fire had no power. I love that. The fire had no power. Never said there was no fire. Oh, there's fire. You better believe there's going to be fires and there's going to be trials, but they have no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. What's the end result? Not that three young men were able to go through a fiery furnace and live. Here's the end result. Here's where God gets the glory. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should nev not serve nor worship any god except their own god. That's the glory. Nebuchadnezzar is worshiping the God of Israel. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks against anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. He's worshiping now, like the kids downstairs are screaming. Anyways. <laughs> Chapter 4. Sorry, guys. Chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has a second dream, 
needs the interpretation of the second dream. But can you write down in your notes, the second dream is a warning? Because listen, guys, not too long after he just says, worship their gods, once again, his heart is proud and he's walking around arrogantly among his kingdom. In chapter 2, God was very specific through Daniel telling Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom, your power, your wealth, everything you've done has only been given to you by the hand of God. Nebuchadnezzar, do you understand that yes, your father is the founder of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, but if it were not for God, he would have never found that empire. If it were not for God, you would have never been in power. If it were not for God, you would have never been able to defeat the southern kingdom. Do you understand that everything you have, even though you don't worship God, has been because God has given it to you? Well, it didn't take too long after that, guys, that Nebuchadnezzar heard that. The Bible says 12 months. Listen, everybody say 12 months. Is that a long time? Yes, it is. Oh, you better believe it is. Some of you that said no, you're probably in sin. That's why you want more time to repent. God gave him 12 months to repent, and he didn't. 12 months to repent, and no, he did not repent the same time that God gave David, the king of Israel, to repent when he committed his sin with Bathsheba. Remember that? Killed her husband, impregnated her. Remember that? Twelve months to repent. And finally the prophet came to him and said, he pointed out, he says, David, you're that man. You're that man. Same thing happened with Nebuchadnezzar. Let me read it to you. Remember, when Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, he's like, I had this dream of this big old tree. And then Daniel's like, praise to the Lord. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the tree. He says, but the tree is getting cut down. Yeah, you're going to be cut down. It was a warning to Nebuchadnezzar. Here's your opportunity to humble yourself before the Lord humbles you. Humble yourself before the Lord humbles you. Well, guess what? Twelve months go by. Listen to this. Chapter 4, verse 28. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the twelve months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not... This great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. Boy, didn't God just tell him on more than one occasion, it's my kingdom? I gave you the power and the, it's not yours. But he's saying, oh, yes, it is. Listen to this, guys. While the word was still in the king's mouth. Wow. Wow. He wasn't even done, the Bible says. A voice fell from heaven, and King Nebuchadnezzar received this word from the Lord. It said, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And everything that the dream said, it said that he would be cut down. It said that he would be removed from the throne. It said that for seven years he would be like a crazy man, eating grass in the fields like a wild ox. And then the Bible says that then there'll come a point, seven years, it'll end because he's going to turn to the Lord and he's going to worship the Lord God and God's going to restore everything back to him. Well, guys, listen, he didn't believe it. Perhaps time went on in between and he probably figured, you know what, it hasn't happened yet, it ain't going to happen. Kind of like the people that Peter speak about in the last days in 2 Peter chapter 3. What did he say? Scoffers will come in the last days. People are going to make fun of you because you come to church. People are going to make fun of you because you're saying Jesus Christ is coming back. People are going to laugh at you and mock you and make you feel stupid about the things you believe about the Lord God. But let me tell you something. Don't get discouraged. All they're doing is fulfilling what the Bible says will happen before Christ comes back. So thank them. <laughs> Pat them on the back. Tell them God bless you. They say, why? I'm treating you so horrible. Because the Bible talks about you. You're fulfilling Bible prophecy. God bless you. Thank you for being a scoffer. Listen. Well, guys, here's the thing. Sometimes when God delays in his response, even his own people get deceived by waiting on the Lord. They get tired and restless. They grow careless and have no desire to wait. You see, the point here is all it does is bring you to a place of captivity and a place to where God will humble you. So many people, God has humbled them, put them through situations in their lives, and guess what? God brings them out of it. They have times of prosperity. They forget. 
they forget. How many vows and promises have we made in some of the greatest trials in our life and you're not even keeping them now? I've heard so many people in some of the greatest trials in their life, oh, I'm going to do this for the Lord and I'm going to do that for the Lord. They feel that way because they're reading the word like never before and praying because they're in a trial and the second God gets them out, guess what? They're not even keeping anything they committed to. Well, the Bible teaches us that this is a common pattern among men. You know what else the Bible teaches? That God's common pattern pattern among his people is that he'll humble them again. He'll do it again. See, Nebuchadnezzar here, for the most part, didn't heed the voice of the Lord. Guess what? The Bible says that very hour in verse 33, Nebuchadnezzar was driven from man, ate grass like oxen, his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagles' feathers and his nails like birds' claws. Guys, listen, it was fulfilled. Look at verse 34. The Bible says, at the end of the time, the end of seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. He repented. And understanding returned to me. And I was blessed the most high God. I blessed the most high God. I blessed the most high God. And praised and honored him who lives forever. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing he does according to his will in the army of heaven. Listen to this. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one, everybody say no one, no one. can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Nobody can restrain his hand. You guys know that this happened for 70 years? Seven years? Study this on your own. Study secular history. Study the kingdom of Babylon. Here's what you're going to find out. Don't look to the Bible, look to history. Seven years in Babylon's history are not recorded. Why? The answer is in the Word of God, because their king went insane for seven years, and they couldn't record what happened. History tells us seven years go unrecorded. Historians are probably like, I wonder why. Well, we ain't historians. Sons and daughters of the Most High God, you can say, I know why. Because God was dealing with this Gentile king. So all of this to say that Babylon's history up until chapter 5 has been with a Gentile king wrestling back and forth with a holy, righteous God. And finally, God bringing him to a place where he's turning and he's saying, I worship the Lord God. And it ends there. So from chapter 4 to 5, there's 20 years, and all of a sudden, Belshazzar. Well, let's look at this. Verse 1. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. Who is this guy? What happened to Nebuchadnezzar? Well, Nebuchadnezzar reigned for clearly almost 40 years. From 605 to 562 B.C., he died. And this king here, Belshazzar, reigned from 550 to 539. There's 12 years now in between there, from the time that Nebuchadnezzar died to the time that this guy began to reign. What happened there? Let me teach you very quickly. It's easy. Let's follow this. Right after Nebuchadnezzar died, his son, Evil, that's his name, Evil Merodach. You might say, wow, who would name their child Evil? Well, you guys call your spouse Evil sometimes. So anyways, this son here recognized his title was this, Evil Merodach. He reigned for a period of two years after Nebuchadnezzar died. He's mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 52, verses 31 through 34. Second Kings, chapter 25, verses 27 through 30. Remember, he's the one that released Jehoiakim out of prison. You guys remember when Babylon first came to besiege the city of Jerusalem, remember that Jehoiakim was king. He had only been king for like a little bit of time, right? And all of a sudden, the city's now getting besieged, right? So he tries to come out with his people, and Babylon takes him captive, and Nebuchadnezzar throws him in prison. And then we see that once Nebuchadnezzar is no longer king, his son, evil Merodach, comes into power. After 37 years, Jehoiakim is released from prison, and the Bible says the king of Babylon at that time treated him very well. You might say, that's an interesting story. You better believe it is. Let me tell you why it's interesting. Because God made a promise to David, the greatest king Israel ever had. Oh, but you just said David was a fornicator and an adulterer. Yes, he was. He was a great sinner, but he was also a great repenter. And God promised 
a dynasty to David. God said there will always be a descendant of yours on the throne, implying what? That there will always be a king ready to sit on the throne in Judah. That's where the temple of the Lord was. That's where the throne was. Let me tell you something. When the city of Judah was destroyed, you know what people were saying? What happened to God's promise? The city's gone. The temple's destroyed. I thought he made a covenant with David. Let me tell you something. When you say the name Jehovah, what you're saying is the keeper of covenants. I might break a promise. No, you know what? I will break a promise. But God doesn't. He's faithful. He keeps his covenants. Even when it looks like it ain't going to happen, God will do it because the Bible says he is not man that he should lie. And what happened? 37 years after this, the city was destroyed, there was a king in prison. And when the next king came into power, he released him and treated him like royalty. Why? Because God always preserves a remnant. Ultimately, when God made that promise to David, who was it fulfilled in? In Christ Jesus. That's why both genealogies of David, found in Matthew and Luke's gospel, lead you through the genealogy of David the king, because Jesus comes from his lineage. And to this day, there's still one seated on the throne, as God promised there would be. It's King Jesus. I think this is a remarkable story because all of this goes with understanding that all these kings were placed in power because God allowed them to be. Even this evil Merodach releasing after 37 years Jehoiakim from prison. Then after Merodach, jot this down for your notes. After Merodach, there was a king in Babylon by the name of Nerigleser. Nerigleser. Neri Gleeser, guys, listen, according to Jeremiah chapter 51, or excuse me, Jeremiah 39, verses 13 and 3 and 13, you'll find that this is none other than Nargel Sherezer. Nargel Sherezer. This is the same king. He reigned for four years. After him was a man by the name of Labrishai Meriduk. Labrishai Meriduk. Meriduk was one of the false gods of Babylon. Labrishai Meriduk only reigned for a few months. That was it. And after him reigned a man by the name of Nabonidus. Nabonidus was the king of Babylon here in chapter 5. He reigned from 556 to 539 BC. 17 years he reigned. But here's what's interesting. You might say, then if he's king, why here in chapter 5 and verse 1, this man, Belshazzar? Well, this is his son. And Nabonidus, guys, listen, wasn't present for about 10 years of his 17-year reign in Babylon. He was fighting the Arabian armies and pushing them back. He was defeating them. So much so that he defeated them that he began to dwell among the Arab people. So he defeated great uh, armies of the Arab people. But his son, Belshazzar, here, also like the name of Daniel, his name means Bel protect the king. Notice how they use the word Bel, which is one of the false gods. They use the name of their gods in their name, kind of like how God did with the people of Israel. Israel, El is the name for God, E-L. The Hebrew word means the Almighty God, El, Samuel, Israel. Those have the name of God in it. And so this is how they did it here with the Babylonian kings. Belshazzar means Baal, protect the king. This is Nabonidus' son. He began to co-reign with his father. So he wasn't number one in command. He was number two in command. But he stood in proxy for his dad. So keep in mind, guys, that at this time, the kingdom of Babylon, though his father pushed back all the, uh, all the armies of the Arabs, listen to this. The Medo-Persian Empire surrounded the city of Babylon. Look at Belshazzar's attitude. Up till this point, the people in Babylon knew the God of Israel because of their king, Nebuchadnezzar. It would seem that Belshazzar had no desire to honor the God of Israel. It would seem that up until this point, within this 20-year period, church, listen, Belshazzar, Nabonidus, and all these other kings that ruled in reign tried so hard to undo what Nebuchadnezzar put in place. Take note as we look at this a little bit further. Here we'll give an account in verses 1 through 4 of Belshazzar's pride. Remember what Nebuchadnezzar said about pride? Verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar of chapter 4, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride 
he is able to put down. Well, the Bible says, Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousands. The emphasis of drinking wine in the presence of the thousands. Well, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 31, Proverbs chapter 31 in verses 4 and 5, it gives us an understanding in regards to kings drinking wine. Let me read it to you. The Bible says this, Proverbs 31, in verse 4 it says, It is not, everybody say it is not. not. For kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine. It's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink. Why? Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. The purpose is for them so that they will make wise judgments. So that they will make wise judgments. Now consider this for a moment. Here you have Belshazzar drinking. Now listen, when the scriptures say don't do it, why? Because you make stupid decisions. Stupid's not a bad word, it's in the Bible. Let's get it straight, read your word, okay? The Bible says a fool is stupid. All right? Are we okay, everybody? Some of you are like, oh my goodness, he said the S word. Okay, the Bible says the word stupid. In the Hebrew, it means stupid. In the Greek, it means stupid. Okay, we got that? When a person comes under the influence of alcohol, especially in a drunken stupor, they make stupid decisions. Very stupid. It distorts judgment. So much is a debate about drinking. People ask me so many questions. Can a Christian drink? You can do whatever you want. Paul says, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are needful. Could I drink? Well, that's up to you if you want to drink. Well, what does the Bible say about drinking? Well, the Bible says that kings are not to drink. That princes are not to drink intoxicating drink. The Bible also says that the priests cannot drink wine or intoxicating drink before going into the Holy of Holies because that's where they would offer the sacrifice up to the Lord. So yeah, there's are those and also those who take a Nazarite vow. They can't drink. So then some would say, well, thank the Lord I'm not a Nazarite. Thank God I ain't no king and I ain't no priest. Well, I guess I can drink. Well, I disagree with you. According to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, the Bible says, Jesus Christ has made you and I kings and priests unto his God. Does that settle the case? Okay, stop bringing it up. Anyways. (laughs) So the Bible says here, while he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring gold and silver vessels. Listen to this. Which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, not his dad. His dad was Nabonidus, but father meaning what? He is a descendant from Nebuchadnezzar on the throne. He said, listen, bring the gold and silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. What what, what vessels? In Daniel chapter 1, in verses 1 through 12, the Bible says here that these were the the articles that belonged to the Lord. The entire book of Exodus. Remember when Moses was building the tabernacle and the Lord kept saying, follow the pattern that's shown to you? Remember that over and over again? Consecrate these things unto the Lord. Set them apart. This was all for the worship and offerings and sacrifices unto the Lord. The tabernacle was a beautiful thing, right? And then what replaced the tabernacle? The temple of the Lord. Did anything change with their commitment to the gold and silver and articles and things that belonged to the Lord in there? No, all of it was dedicated unto the Lord. It was given to him for the purpose of what? Worshiping the Lord. Now, Nebuchadnezzar comes into power, destroys the temple. The Bible says he takes all the articles of gold and silver that were dedicated to the Lord and he put them in the house of his God. Already desecrating. The statement that Nebuchadnezzar made in the start of his reign when he destroyed Judah was this. Not only did I defeat the people of Jerusalem, but I defeated your God. Pretty interesting statement. Let me tell you something. Then God dealt with him, right? Boy, by the end of his story, he was praising the God of Israel, right? He's saying, we got to worship him. He's the one. Well, guess what? Belshazzar, guys, listen. Says, give me those same vessels of gold and silver. Things that were set apart to worship a holy, righteous God. Does that bother you that they did that with those things? 
I bet you it does. How much more so does it bother the heart of the Lord when you yourself have been given over to the Lord by calling yourself a Christian? Do you know that the Bible says, as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, possess your vessel, possess it in honor? Yes, you are vessels of the Lord also. Why isn't it a problem when we use our vessels to dishonor the Lord? You see, guys, what Belshazzar is attempting to do is undo everything that Nebuchadnezzar put in place in regards to the Lord God. All of a sudden, he says, bring these articles that were offered up to the God of Israel. Listen to this. That they brought the gold vessels and had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, they drank from them. They drank from them. Look at verse 4. They drank wine. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 21 clearly teach that drunkenness is a sin. It's a sin. And what did they do? They drank from the vessels that were dedicated to the Lord. Listen. And praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. What does that mean? They begin to worship what? Their idols, their false gods. And they made the articles and the vessels of the Lord like their false gods. How many of you guys know that in the same Time in which they did this, look at verse 5, in the same hour. Everybody say, in the same hour. In the same hour. Okay, well now let's look at chapter 4 very quickly. I just want to show you something. Listen to this. Verse 31, while the words were still in the king's mouth, the Lord responded. He judged Nebuchadnezzar. In the same hour that Belshazzar says, bring the holy things of the God of Israel so we can drink our wine. And you know that, you guys listen, do you know that not even the priest could drink out of those vessels? Did you know that? Whatever was put in those vessels in the Old Testament when it was sacrificed up to the Lord, all it was done was poured out on the altar. It was a drink offering. The priest was forbidden. If he would have drank from it, God would have struck him dead right there. They weren't created for the king or the priest, excuse me, to worship himself. It's to worship and honor the Lord. But here, Belshazzar is just drinking from it with his, with his wives and his concubines. They're desecrating the things that belong to the Lord. And at the very same time, the fingers of a man's hand appeared. Can you imagine this? They're probably tripping out drunk. <laughs> All of a sudden, this, this image comes in front of them. They see the fingers of a man's hands. Listen, guys, this is a miracle. It's a miraculous miracle of God. And it appeared. And it wrote opposite the lampstands on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Can you imagine this? They're drunk. They're drinking. People always say they've seen crazy stuff when they're drunk. Here, listen, this is beyond their drunk and their drinking. Listen, the king's countenance changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. He was trembling. Here they are drinking out of the vessels of the Lord that belong to the Lord. He's desecrating the things of God. And all of a sudden, this hand appears, and it starts to write on the wall in the plaster. Listen, plaster. Hello? You might say, how can it write in the plaster? I mean, it's plaster. It's rock. I mean, how could it write in it? Has it ever occurred to you in Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18 that it wasn't Moses who etched the Ten Commandments in the tablets? The Bible says it was the finger of God. Oh, now we're getting some understanding. Check this out. Once again, the very finger of God is working in a miraculous way. How it appeared, what it looked like, we don't know. All we know is the best description that is given to us here in verse 5. It says, in the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Notice that. That he saw the part of the hand that wrote. What he's seen, we don't know. All we do know is the description it gives is the finger of man's hand. It appeared, and it wrote. This in and of itself is a miracle. 
And I'll tell you what, if they were drunk, I guarantee you they're sober now. Very quickly, what is that? What just happened? Let me give you guys a little bit of understanding about this. This is not too far-fetched. As a matter of fact, in Exodus 31 and verse 18, as I declared to you, the very finger of God is what wrote the commandments in the tablets of stone that Moses himself had. The Bible also reveals to us that that wasn't the end of the finger of God. Exodus 31, 18, Daniel chapter 5 and verse 5, and also John chapter 8 and verse 6. You remember the story, the woman caught in the act of adultery, remember that? Jesus is teaching to the crowds, and in the midst of Jesus' teaching, a woman is brought to him by the religious leaders of the day, and they bring her to Jesus, and they say, this woman is caught in the very act of adultery. Notice that the Bible says, in the act. Meaning what? How they brought her before Jesus, we can only imagine when a person is caught in the very act. The distraction. It's evident that she was caught in the act. Distracting Jesus' message is what the enemy always wants to do. If he can distract our minds, if he can distract getting the content of the message, he's prevailed. They bring this woman, and the religious leaders say, well, listen, we're going to bring her, her before Jesus. And they said, Jesus, in Moses' law, it says that this woman should be stoned to death. What are you going to do about it? Jesus had two choices to make. One, he could have said, well, if Moses' law says to stone her, then stone her. And if he would have did that, all the people that he was friends of sinners of, the sinners that he hung out with, the ones that he went and ate in their house, guess what they would have said? All this was for nothing. He's not really our friend. And if he would have said, well, don't stone her, then the religious leaders would have said, this is blasphemy. You're violating the word of God. And they would have stoned Jesus to death. But the Bible says the woman there, humiliated and shameful, in front of this crowd of people in the middle of a Bible study, Jesus stoops to the ground and with his very finger he writes in the dirt. And the Bible goes on to say that they're asking Jesus, what are you going to do? Jesus then gets up and says, let him without sin cast the first stone. In the original language, the term without sin, it means let him without this sin cast the first stone. What sin? Sexual sin. The sin of dishonoring the Lord. And the Bible says immediately Jesus once again stooped down and began to write again with his finger. And there are so many people say, oh, you know, he was probably writing the names of each of those religious leaders from the oldest to the youngest and the account and the date in which he's exposing their sin in front of them. Probably not the case. But whatever Jesus wrote and whatever he did drew the attention to the religious leaders that they themselves had no way in any right to bring this woman before Jesus. And the Bible says from the oldest to the youngest, they begin to walk away. By the time the last one walked away, Jesus looked up at the woman and said, where are your accusers? She says, there's none here to accuse me. Well, then according to the law, Deuteronomy chapter 19, neither can I. Because the Bible says on the account of two or three witnesses. Notice that. Well, there was none there to testify and witness. So Jesus did keep the law. So what did Jesus write? I don't know. But I do believe that when Jesus stooped down and wrote in the ground, he was fulfilling Bible prophecy. In the book of the prophet Jeremiah, in chapter 17, and verse 13, the Bible says, And the names of those that forsake him shall be written in the earth. It's talking about the Messiah. And I believe that's what Jesus was doing. The religious leaders were forsaking Jesus. How and what he wrote, I don't know. All I can assume is that he was fulfilling the word that was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. You see, guys, the very finger of God, the very hand of God is a very powerful thing. Let me remind you of a psalm, Psalm chapter 8. You can turn there if you'd like. But Psalm chapter 8 says this about the very finger of God. In Psalm chapter 8, the Bible speaks this, or verse 3, Psalm 8, 8, 3, excuse me. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? Does God have fingers? Does God 
have a body? Does God have a physical form? May I just give you a little bit of a teaching here? Jesus said in John chapter 4 to the woman at the well that God is spirit and he's seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Does God have hands, eyes, and also no? What we have here are two words in the original uh, understanding of what we believe about this. And the first word is anthros, which really is the idea of the study of humanity. Anthropology, the study of man. Anthros means human. Morphe means form or shape. Anthropophorbic means a human form or shape. We use this expression to better describe God. God is spirit. And he's seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. There's no hands, there's no eyes. Some people say then, doesn't the Bible say we're made in the image of God? Genesis chapter 21 and verse 20, or chapter 1 and verse 26. Yes, it does say that. But the image of God is not physical form. The image of God is the ability to communicate and to choose. It's intellect, it's will, it's emotion. That's the image of God. And we are made in his image. We are created to worship the Lord God. And so what we find here is this. What does it mean then when the Bible says the finger of God, the hand of God? It's talking about the power of God. Consider this for a moment as we continue in our study on this. People have asked the question, I just want to be led by the hand of God. Well, the Bible speaks of God's hand and God's fingers as judgment. Job chapter 36 and verse 32 speaks of it as judgment. As a matter of fact, the Bible also says in Psalm chapter 10 in verse 12, and Job chapter 13 in verse 21, and Isaiah 14, 26, that God's hand will come in judgment. In this case here, the hand of the Lord is coming to judge. In the case of the woman that was caught in the act of adultery, the hand of the Lord was coming to save. You see how God works? God does have his hands, if you will, in the affairs of our lives. God is completely in control. And what did Nebuchadnezzar say? He said there at the end of verse 35 of chapter 4, No one can restrain his hand. No one, nothing can stop God's judgment as it's coming forth. Then the king's countenance changed and his thoughts troubled him so that his joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. The king cried aloud to bring the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation, listen to this, shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold. The being clothed with purple, well, that's authority. Remember in Esther chapter 8, verse 15? And also this, this chain of gold, guys, listen, around the neck. Pharaoh did the same thing. Genesis chapter 41 and verse 42. He says, and he shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Isn't that interesting that he said third? It just goes to show you that his father was king. He was second. The only authority he had was to make somebody third. Proves that his father was still king at this time. The Bible goes on to say, Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. This is not any news to you and me, right? Happened in chapter 2 and verse 2. It happened in chapter 4 and verses 6 and 7. They could not interpret the dream. So the Bible says, Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. The king, then the king, Belshazzar, was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed and his lords were astonished. I like verse 10. The queen. This is most likely his mother or grandmother, not his wives because they were with him. Because of the words of the king and his lords came to the banquet hall, the queen spoke saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. I mean, how can it not? Look at what I just seen. Nobody can give me the interpretation of this. What's going on? She says, there is a man. <laughs> there is a man. Now remember, Daniel had been out of the scene or the public eye for about 20 years at this point. Belshazzar knows of the stories, but does not know Daniel. She says, there is a man in your kingdom in whom, listen to what she says, the spirit of the holy God is upon him. Think about that. And in the days of your father, she's talking about Nebuchadnezzar, 
Light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. You know what she's saying? Go back to what Nebuchadnezzar, your father, said. Go back. Go back. Yeah, you're surrounded by the Medo-Persian Empire. And yes, your father Nabonidus has defeated the Arab armies around them. But guess what? What, Nebu what Nebuchadnezzar understood in this dream is that Babylon would one day come to an end. Guys, listen, this is why we titled this the beginning of the end. This is the end of Babylon's dynasty and reign. She says, there's a man who can interpret your dreams. Look at this. And as much as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Can you imagine? He's probably like, wow, his name's almost like mine. <laughs> now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. Look at what she says. Let Daniel be called. 20 years not doing anything. And it's believed that up until this point, Daniel is already 85 years old. Can I tell you guys that a true servant never abandons their ministry? A true servant never abandons their ministry, ever. They don't. Daniel didn't. He wasn't saying, hey, I'm retired now. It's not my gig no more, man. You know, nothing like that. 85 years old. And still available to be used by God. You see at this time guys. Nebuchadnezzar had reigned for 44 years. And this king with his father. 17 year reign. And guys listen. Daniel's now 85 years old. And this battle on this empire. Was a fortified double walled city. 300 feet high the walls were. As a matter of fact guys listen. They also had 85 foot wide walls. You could put six chariots side by side and run them along the top of the walls of this kingdom. There was all kinds of moats, very deep moats in between the two walls that surrounded this city. There was no way it can be penetrated at all whatsoever. It was impregnable. You cannot get in there. Belshazzar, guys, listen, even had up to 20 years of food supply. So in his mind, he thought this is all good. 250 towers that were huge, surrounded this massive empire. And the only security that was in there was a man by the name of Daniel. 85 years old. This guy's going to help us? Guys, listen. The hand of the Lord God had not stopped moving. The Bible says very clearly, the hand of the Lord is not only described in judgment, but it's described in creation. Jot this down if you're taking notes. Psalm chapter 8 and verse 3, we just read it. When I consider your works, the moon and the stars, he's given a description that it's the very hand of God. Psalm 102 and verse 25. Isaiah 45 and verse 12. Jeremiah 32, 17. And Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 10. You see, guys, God's hand is not only active in creation, active in judgment, but God's hand is active in moving you and me. How many of you guys want to be led by God in everything you do? Amen. Well, let me give you a little food for thought here. The finger and the hand of God doesn't only move on a person's life when there's judgment. But his hand has been moving since the beginning of creation. Does it still move today? Very much so. The Bible says this, according to 1 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 11. 2 Chronicles chapter 30 and verse 12. In Job chapter 19 and verse 21, that God's hand still moves and leads His people. The hand of God in our lives is guiding us and leading His people. You want to be more acquainted with this? Three things, jot it down if you're taking notes. First, the question is, how do I know if God's leading me and directing me? How do I know if I'm being led by the Lord, as the scriptures say, by the very hand of God? Point number one, become familiar with God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Become familiar with the word of God. God always confirms in his words the things that he's directing and leading, and it's never contrary. Let me tell you something. God never pulls you out of something unless you're in sin. We pull ourselves out of things. 
So many times people say, oh, God called me to do this, and they go from serving to sitting. That only happens if you're in sin. If you're not in sin, you've pulled yourself out. You're not hearing from the Lord. Get acquainted with his word. So many people get acquainted with feeling. I've heard so many people say, oh, I just have a peace in my heart. That's not confirmation from the Lord. That's you feeding into your emotion and your feeling because you feel good about what you want to do. Second thing you need to do, pray for wisdom. Biggest mistake people make. You don't make a decision off of emotion. James chapter 1 and verse 5 says that if you lack wisdom, ask the Lord. He'll give it to you. Pray for wisdom. And the third thing is trust the Lord God. Trust the Lord. You have to trust God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, the Bible says, Trust the Lord with part of your heart, with some of your heart. No, with? Some of you like didn't even know it said all. Yes, all. All of it. Not part of it, all of it. Trust in the Lord God with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in some of your ways. There it is there. You see, you guys know what time it is, man. Stop bugging me for counseling. You know it. My goodness. Trust the Lord God. Listen, with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. The hand of the Lord. God is faithful to do it. He desires to lead His people. Listen, it's there in plain scripture. Point number one, get acquainted with his word. Point number two, pray for wisdom. And point number three, trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Then Daniel was brought in before the king and the king spoke and he said to Daniel, are you the Daniel who is one of the captives of Judah whom my father the king brought from Judah? The enemy always trying to remind us of our past. I have heard of you that the Spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. Daniel's probably like, yeah, we've been here before. And I have heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now if you read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, just listen to this guy's voice. Listen to this. You shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck. He wanted to pimp Daniel out, man. (laughs) Notice what he says here. And you shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself. I ain't going to be your pimp, fool. Listen to this. Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. I love that. I don't do this for self-gain. I don't do this to get something out of it. I don't serve the Lord so I got something coming to me. I do this because I honor and I love the Lord God. That's what Daniel is saying. He's saying, I don't do this because I want any type of position. I don't do this because I need a gold chain around my neck. Any of that. Listen, he doesn't ask for any of that. He says, yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. Great reminder. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all the people's nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished he executed, whomever he wished he kept alive, whomever he wished he set up, and whomever he wished he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, And his spirit was hardened in pride. He was deposed from his kingly throne. And they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beast. And dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen. The body was wet with the dew of heaven. Till he knew that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men. Appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all of this. Wow. What does Peter say? It's better for you to have not known than to have known and disobey. And you lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, 
and the God who holds your breath in his hands and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the finger of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written, many, many, tekel euphorosin. What does this mean? It means this. This is the interpretation of each word. Many means God has numbered your kingdom. In other words, your kingdom is over. And finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. In other words, you have been weighed and assessed. It's over. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persian. And Perez or Euphorosin can also be the word for Persia because that's what Persia did. It divided the kingdom and that's what the word means, division. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him, listen to this, that he should be third ruler in the kingdom. How quick does God do what he says he's going to do. Look at verse 30. That very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius, the Mede, received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. What happened? This is what happened. October 16th, 539 BC, a Persian general dug a trench, lowered by the water of the Euphrates. Remember the Euphrates ran through the kingdom of Babylon. Emptied some of the water out. And was able to dig a hole. And go under the wall. And he was able to take the whole kingdom captive. The whole kingdom captive. The second you take God out of the equation. And you take this vessel of honor. And dishonor the Lord with it. Listen. Your little kingdom that you're building. Will be taken captive by the enemy. But if you trust in the Lord God, if you become acquainted with his word, if you pray for wisdom, and if you trust him, he'll always give you the victory. In Isaiah 45, in verses 1 through 4, the prophecy of the destruction was foretold 150 years earlier. Can I tell you guys that God is faithful at keeping his word even when it's judgment and destruction? He's faithful. He's faithful. 